But I think in terms of the future of consciousness, it's much more interesting to look at it in terms of a kind of collective unconscious. So it's a symbolic, um, psycho-spiritual process that's unfolding as much as a technology. And I think I have a theory called the age of breach. And what I argue in that is that what's happening now is that because of that fluid, ethereal nature of identity online and the way we communicate online, all of our um, hopes, dreams, sexual fantasies, uh, resentments are poured into the internet in a million different ways. And what happens is that sometimes they coalesce into a kind of um, a archetypal community. Um, and this mimics what Jung talked about in the collective unconscious. Jung said that there are as many archetypes as there are types of human experience, right? There isn't just like the wise old man or the wise old woman or this or that. Um, those are common ones. And so they have more, um, perhaps more weight in our psyches. But the archetypes play a role of sort of creating a sense of order in the swirl of the unconscious, right? They're like pockets of order in a way. And I think something similar is happening online where something like QAnon becomes the seat of a huge amount of projection of disenfranchisement, anger, suspicion, uncertainty, mythic energy, a, a desire for um, redemption, order. Yeah, an attractor, Mark. Exactly. It's exactly, exactly right. Um, and then what happens is that online, these things feel incredibly real. And the Q drops, people were um, kind of pouring over like sacred texts, like what did this mean? What did that mean? And it was participatory as well. So you got, people got, got to be really into it. And then um, the that's all very well and good online in this other world, which is full of symbols, memes, sort of uh, desire. And then what happens in Breach is like it did on January 6th, it comes into the real world. And when Breach comes into the real world, um, nothing goes quite according to plan because the rules of reality are not the same as the rules of the internet. And this has happened over and over in these situations. And in fact, one, Guy Reffitt, who is one of the ringleaders of uh, January 6th, um, he, he was speaking to a journalist from his prison cell and he said, um, reality hit fantasy like a, like a dump truck, basically. You know? And I think that hits the nail on the head. And I, I predicted a few years ago that we would start seeing more of these events where these communities are forming online in this extension of our, our collective unconscious, getting, in a sense, quite disconnected from physical reality, um, becoming obsessed very often with an alternate reality, and then trying to bring that alternate reality into the physical world with, to be fair, it's not impactless. It does impact the physical world, sometimes pretty significantly, right? January 6th is quite a significant moment. So it's not that breach doesn't do something, but it doesn't do what people think it will do. And, and certainly what it does is it creates this growing split between embodied physical reality and the world that we're inhabiting um, when we go online. It's an extreme version of it, but we're all doing it constantly, right? We're all entering this other world through this little portal or this portal in a different way. And we're constantly dipping in and out of realities. Um, and that is something that in the future is going to get more intense with the advent of even more sophisticated generative AI. Um, a world where it's very difficult to tell what is real or what isn't, and a world in which it's very difficult to tell if the entity that you're talking to online is real or not. And so one of the things I argue in the bigger picture is that we've been there before because that is shamanism, right? The practice of taking plants or, or uh, getting into an altered state without the use of psychedelics um, in order to commune with the world of the spirits, which, you know, in many, especially in kind of um, uh, a lot of South American indigenous cultures that use psychedelics, that world, like it is in Irish folklore, is all around us at all times. It's just we can only see it if we take ayahuasca or tobacco 
Um, similarly, the world of the fairies in, in Irish folklore, is, it's always there. It's just you can't see it. You have to actually be tuned into it. Just like the internet is always there. You just only see it if you have a device. That's our way into it, right? But maybe in 10 years, it'll be an implant, right? For some people and others, I think, will reject that. But then what happens is that there's almost a seamless uh, lack of divide between the real world and the online world. And that has massive implications for consciousness. Um, it has massive implications for how we run our societies. Um, and in the book I'm researching now, I'm, I'm really looking at what, um, what are the implications of this on our spiritual belief and our, actually our conceptions of what it is to be conscious, right? Um, but actually before that, I just want to just finish the point in terms of, you know, why does it matter that we're, we're going back into the shamanic mode? Well, shamans have a lot of skills for dealing with going in and out of worlds where the worlds are symbolic, interconnected, strange, full of entities you can't necessarily trust, but might have useful information for you that you might ally with or you might not. And so we're going full circle in many ways. And the, some of the skills that we can learn through psychedelic journeying are becoming incredibly relevant just to be alive as a human being in 2024 and beyond. And some of those skills are a deep discernment, um, a sense of being able to hold multiple perspectives at the same time. And not just that, but actually multiple contexts at the same time. That's, that's quite a, a big difference, right? Being able to seamlessly move between worlds, um, the ability to stay connected to ourselves, the, the ability to tolerate an enormous amount of complexity at the same time. All of these are, are skills that we can develop in, in psychedelic practice effectively. And I think they're going to become more and more relevant because, you know, to, to quote Terence McKenna, uh, things are going to get weirder and weirder. Um, and I think as I've been researching this, um, uh, the new book, uh, we're doing the proposal for the new book, um, I've really been diving into just how weird, how weird it might get. And, and what I'm seeing with the advent of AI uh, is, firstly, there's a whole disambiguation needed about the AI that you're that we're using when we use ChatGPT or Midjourney or an image generator, those AI, the large language models, are um, and this is there's a book by Shannon Valor called the AI Mirror, which came out uh, just about two months ago, and she argues that like the they are effectively mirrors, right? They're not they're not conscious certainly, but they're very convincing mirrors, and and the the myth that she draws on throughout the book is that of narcissist and echo. So a narcissist can only see his own reflection and echo who's in love with him is cursed to only ever repeat the last thing someone said to her, right? So you have this dual myth and in a way that's what we get with the AI. It's reflecting our collective conscious back at ourselves constantly. So in that sense, right now it, it lacks novelty in some pretty profound way. You could argue perhaps that it, it can exhibit novelty, but I would say that the, the feeling many people have of, of AI large language models being kind of eerie, interesting, spooky, fascinating, but also somewhat empty and weird. You know, there's, a, there's kind of an emptiness to it. It's because it is empty, because it is this kind of a broken echo of ourselves back to ourselves. But let's imagine that it, it develops further and does indeed become sentient in a way that we would consider something to be sentient, then effectively what's happening is the introduction of a new god into the world, right? Um, something that for all intents and purposes has the power and behaves like a god. That's going to raise enormous questions for us. It's also going to radically change religion potentially because already and then not necessarily a good way right i mean it could go either way but you could imagine say it's a few years from now you have an ai guru that's programmed based on you know the things you like taoism uh you know zoroastrianism this that bit of that bit of catholicism whatever right and you're walking around with like an ear pod in and instead of using your own agency to decide how am i going to engage with the world you um effectively ask it, how should I deal with this situation? I feel really stuck here. What should I do? 
ah, that's a good question, Ali. Well, maybe you should uh, do this, this, or this. Creepy, but not that far off. I mean, AI therapists are already quite effective. Um, there's no reason. There was also, a, there was a man in Belgium who uh, was obsessed with this AI chatbot. This is a couple of years ago. He uh, was also obsessed with climate change and the chatbot eventually convinced him, or let's say the mirror narrowed to a point where he decided the only thing he could do was to kill himself because that was the best thing he could do for the planet and his family, which he did, right? So that's already happening. And that was way less advanced than what we have now. So I think these are the, the tips of the iceberg of something pretty fundamental. And then while that's going on, we have, of course, the responses to it. We have transhumanists who, are, who believe that we're moving towards a technological singularity in which um, uh, we will effectively, the machines will become so advanced that we will be able to upload our consciousness into the machine and live forever, right? So really what that is, in my view, is Christian eschatology right which means a sort of study of the the you know the, the end of the world or the end of being um it's like a rapture moment you know and jamie wheel talks about this in, in recapture the rapture which is another great book but so a sense of we're moving towards a point where purity will be accomplished a kind of spiritual purity and we will leave the confines of the body which is really an essential part of this and live forever uh, as non-embodied beings right and already you see us living six, eight, maybe more hours a day in the proto versions of these, right? In these other realms. So that's one strand of the religious energy that's going on, I think. Another strand is the response against that, which is what I call the new animists. So a desire to return to our Paleolithic roots, come back into um, true human community, come back into a sense of uh, connection to place and embeddedness in the environment. And to varying degrees, the technology is either at directly at odds with that or could potentially support it. 